and welcome to Caribbean Connections. I am Dion Legault, the Head of Corporate Communications at Caribbean Airlines, and I am delighted to host this series of conversations with leaders from various countries and sectors in the region and throughout the diaspora. Caribbean Connections is a platform to engage with luminaries and stakeholders to get their views on issues impacting each of us with a view to stimulating meaningful discussion and to get a bird's eye view into some of the Caribbean's leading personalities. Today, we have as our guest, Mr. Dominic Hadid, who is quite famous in the circles of regional entrepreneurship and currently leads or has investments in a diverse group of successful enterprises in the Caribbean, including Blue Waters Products Limited, Blue Waters St. Lucia Limited, Fabric Land Limited, and Domhad Investments, just to name a few. Please join us for this amazing opportunity to have a conversation with him. Mr. Hadid, welcome to Caribbean Connections. Thank you, Dion. Glad to be here. Yes, it's certainly a pleasure and we will get right into it. So we know that Blue Waters was started in 1999, but since then, it has really grown into one of the Caribbean's most well-known brands. Wherever we are in the region, we see Blue Waters very present. So can you tell us about this journey and some of the challenges that you would have faced along the way? Oh, well, I don't know how much time you have with respect to the <laughs> challenges. Um, I don't think anybody could uh, do anything worthwhile or accomplish anything worthwhile without uh, lots of challenges. But I'll give you a little background on the journey. Um, it was something I wanted to do ever since I was in college. Um, not sure why it interested me. Uh, I know my dad was in the fabric business and I didn't want to be in fabrics. It was, uh, you ladies are lovely, but you know, this week you want stripes, next week you want flowers, the week after that is stretch. So, you know, I, I was very, very uh, dynamic uh, trying to keep up with the trends. I wanted something a little bit more stable. And, and, and I was looking for things that at the time they didn't have back home. And bottled water was one of them. Um, now, everybody was telling me there was a reason for that because you had all these big soft drink guys and nobody was doing water. Who's going to want to pay for water when it's something you can get for free in the tap? I, I don't know why. Even though I was going to college, I was supposed to be a bright guy. That didn't seem to be an obstacle for me. But uh, because I thought we'd give a better taste in product and if you, you know, make it available at a fair price, you should, should do well. And I set out to do that. Uh, didn't get to do it initially. Um, took about five years to get the family to uh, allow me to even venture into this. So I had to still try the fabric business and convince myself why I didn't like it. You know, I, I kept, you know, telling my dad, you know, I'm not seeing anybody who wants to be a seamstress and tailor when they grow up. So, you know, uh, this business at some point will come to an end. Um, so I, I went out on this venture, started to do it um, as best as I could. We were very small. By the time I was able to get the chance to do it, there was about 30 or 40 other brands already on the market. I mean, pretty much everybody with a filling line at that time was doing bottled water. And every distributor at the time carried a brand of bottled water. So we kind of came to the party late. But what surprised me still, in my view, was that nobody was doing it well. Uh, you had a range of, of sizes, uh, but no one brand had all the sizes that people wanted, um, or what I would call it beverage occasions. So we just set out to say, okay, you know, we're going to first make sure we have the range of products that people want. Then what we also found out is that people don't like, uh, you know, no, nobody was giving them a consistent taste. So they didn't have proper quality control. So you would get um, you know, one day it tastes good, next day it didn't taste that good. Or they didn't have a consistent service. Sometimes they deliver, sometimes they don't. So even though it was a crowded market by the time we got in, I just figured, you know what, they still have room for somebody to do it right. And, um, and we set out to do that. Um, as you can imagine, doing things right in the Caribbean could be a challenge. Uh, doing it right at a level of scale as we got larger became even more difficult. And then as you mash people corn, as they say, you know, whether it be the competitors whom you are 
trying to displace the customers whom you're trying to work with, or as I say, we used to work sometimes you have to train them because to give a good service, you need to get the support of the customer, whether it be proper forecasting. You know, we can't run an ambulance service, you know, so they kind of have to tell us what they want in advance so we can plan appropriately. So a lot of that you know, were, were things we had to do at the beginning that we didn't think we had to do. We just thought that was understood and normal. You know, again, coming from a retail background, you know, we would plan properly for the seasons, whether it be Carnival, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, Easter, and, you know, so you, you would have assumed that everybody else in the other, any of the other retail businesses did similar, but apparently that was not the case. Uh, so, so we had a lot of training of the of the of the, the, the customers to do, but the journey was hard. I mean, we, we moved as we started to grow. We moved from uh, you know one factory, it was about maybe eight thousand square feet. A few years later, to what is now Piaco Plaza there at the, at the intersection. That was the yeah. second factory, and then where we are now in Orange Grove, that was the third factory. Uh, we built three of them, and you know, we keep outgrowing these factories. Uh, I think probably within a 12-year period. So every three, four years, we were moving uh, because we didn't didn't think that we would have done that well. I mean, you know, everybody kept telling us you're not going to do that well, and it's only a matter of time before the big boys put you out of business. So you kind of in the back of your mind thought you're going to do well, but you said just in case I don't, you know, I must have a backup plan. And you know, even when uh, you know where you, you see Piaco Plaza now, that was the second factory. My mind was, well, if that was too big. Uh, and I went, did go bankrupt. I could always convert it into a shopping center. At least that was the back of my mind, was the parachute that I would pull in the event of. Mm-hmm. And uh, even when we moved to where we are today, uh, which was a much bigger factory, and it was almost designed the, the same length and width of Gulf City Mall. You know, we say, okay, well, if, if we go past this time, it would just be a bigger mall, you know, because it was, you're pushing it every time. And I mean, it was like the more we grow, the more we owe, you know, so it was like, uh, it was just you were piling on debt as you were growing because this business was a very, very, and still is a very capital intensive business. Um, you want to produce more, it's more equipment, more space, more trucks, more chillers, more receivables, more inventory. So it was a constant uh, challenge uh, to keep to keep growing, and then more good people. You know, some of the things that we encountered was, you know, we wanted to get the best and brightest, but the best and brightest would not have left. You know, I don't want to call any of the competitors, but they would not have left those three or four large players to come to Blue Waters. You know, they were like, Blue who? You know, I'm not going to leave and take that risk. So we were trying our best with the people that we could get um, to, 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 do, uh, to do things the best that we could have. You know, you go to all the trade shows, you try your best to learn uh, what's happening. We tried to, uh, you know, do some acquisitions to learn, go on. It was just a, a constant uh, battle, you know, but, but a good battle. And, and it was a... Uh, one that I think most entrepreneurs when growing a business or starting a business from scratch could relate to, you know. I used to feel like, uh, I used to tell them, I said, it's like, if I, I like to speak a lot in analogies so that people can understand. And I said, you know, there were times where I felt as if I was running downhill, uh, trying to tie my shoelace and brushing my, my teeth at the same time. I mean, just wow. doing that. It just was impossible. You just didn't know, you were just going with it. You know, it was like, wherever it took you, you were just going with it and just, had to deal with it, uh, you know, nobody felt sorry for you and you can't feel sorry for yourself. It's just, I'm going to take it as it comes, you know, and um, that's what we did. And, uh, you know, we we're, were fortunate that the products were well received uh, because we did do our best to give people a consistent product and what they, you know, what we promised them is what we delivered. I think mo- most people, what, what we, what we, what I, what I, my approach has been kind of different to what most people do. I think most business people, and I don't mean any disrespect by this, because they're always trained to make maximized profits. Uh, you know, they want to give, they want to charge the most for their product and give the customers the least possible. So they want to give the least and most. For, for me, it was, and in all the things that we do, it was almost the reverse. It was how much could I give the customer for the least amount of money? You know, we, we, it's all about, it's about really adding value. So. There'll be times where we're not the cheapest, but we'll give you the most. You know, you'll get most value, most consistency, best best service, things like that. And, and uh, the right kind of people would appreciate that, you know. And uh, even when we set out, you know, I've, I've been it clear, when you want to give a, a great level of service or a great product, you're not going to be able to please everybody. And I'm not going to insist that uh, my team try to please everybody, you know. So you know, even in our... Um, 
mission statement where we say to profitably inspire and delight those we choose to serve with quality function, great taste and beverages, you know, where we choose to serve. So we acknowledge that there will be people that we will never be able to please. We know who they are, and, and when I say not by name, but we know the descriptors, the attributes of these people who we could never please. You know, and, and, and we tell the team it's okay not to serve them. You know, and we focus on the ones that uh, we could, you know, whose goals, visions, missions, values are as closely aligned to us as possible. You know, and, and, and we try to give them, uh, you know, what they expect, you know. Um, and that's kind of been the philosophy, whether in the beverage business, real estate business, or any business, um, you know, it's always been that, you know, how, how much more could we give people for the price that we were already charging? You know, that was always been a value add proposition because if not, why buy from us? You know, and, you know, at the beginning, we thought it was a branded product, which has come down to a commodity as well in some forms of fashion. But if you, if you, if we, if we drop the ball and, and, and stop giving them a good service, you know, we'll be out of business in short order. Well, Mr. Hadi, this is a most interesting and intriguing journey and story. And there's so many anecdotes within that, that one can, you know, jump and have an entire conversation on. But I should tell you before I continue, if you haven't thought about it, you really should give consideration to writing a book. Uh, no, I'm, I'm very serious for entrepreneurs in the region. Uh, everybody's telling me that. I don't have the time for that. Um, I still think I'm too young. I mean, I could still fail. I mean, it's still the story. I, I, would be, I think it'd be a little bit arrogant of me to think that my story is ended and it's now time to put a lovely bow on it. Um, who knows? I mean, I, I could be in mid chapter. I mean, I don't have, a, I don't, I don't know yet. Indeed, you can be, but just the the journey of the start is so intriguing that it is worth documenting. And you don't have to write it yourself. Huh? There are persons who can just as we are chatting, document it and put it together for you, because it is something to consider. Yes, it speaks to a, sto a story of perseverance and courage and not being intimidated by, okay, we are, we're, we're not first in the market, but you have a clear vision and vision is so important when one is, you know, setting objectives and that power of focus is tremendous and it is very inspiring. You spoke about Blue Waters and your growth and the extensive distribution channels throughout the region, but you touch on a point of quality and maintaining quality and control. How do you maintain that constant supply and that quality control that really are the pillars of your brand? It, it starts first with uh, great people, uh, great equipment, uh, the best raw materials you can get your hands on. And then trust, but verify, you know, I trust the people, I trust the systems, I trust the equipment, but I verify. And what I mean by verify is external audits. So we have our own internal audits, but we are actually audited by five different external bodies. So we're, you know, International Bottle Water Association, they will audit. NSF, that's National Safety Federation, they will audit. As these are, those are two international bodies. You will have Kariri, who comes in and tests uh, randomly weekly, and then spot checks monthly. So I mean, and all of these bodies, they could come in when they want, how they want. You know, we produce Pepsi here in Trinidad uh, at our factory for uh, Trinidad and Barbados. So Pepsi audits as well. And then we, because we supply a lot of the quick service restaurants like KFC, Pizza Hut and what have you, their quality people audit. So we have five different bodies that, that randomly come and audit us. So it, it's not unusual for every six to eight weeks or so, we're, ha we're having a spot check audit. Um, so our teams have to stay on their toes. I like that. It allows me to sleep, you know, because we, we, I know that they're always, uh, somebody's always checking behind them besides me. Um, but again, a lot, of, a lot of it is that if people know what you expect and you say, look, we're going to do, you know, we always wanted to build a first world company in a third world country. That was always one of my challenges. And people said, oh, you can't do it. Uh, you know, that doesn't work in the Caribbean. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, hire one and a half million people, you know, in Trinidad there's about five or six hundred of us here. And I'm saying, I don't believe that we're that bad 
that I couldn't get five, 600 people who believe in doing a good job if given the right training and the right tools and the right compensation and what have you. And um, that's kind of what we've been able to do. So, I mean, you can't expect excellence with poor equipment, poor raw materials and poor people. It doesn't work. So it's really about raising that level. And I, I always tell my team, I say, this is something I say all the time, success is the absence of failure. If you remove the things that make you fail, what's left is success. So we don't focus on success. We focus on the things that make you fail. And we just get rid of it, you know? So you don't come to any of our meetings and see, this is all the greens, this was working. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the reds. What, what is not working? How do we fix it? And that's part of, uh, you know, getting people to understand uh, that, you know, there's a difference between, the, uh, between a failed idea and a person who's a failure. So, you know, we've, you know, once people are not afraid to show what's going wrong in their department or ask for help, uh, you know, that's how you can improve stuff. But if everybody was hiding stuff because they're afraid they're going to get fired, they're going to uh, be embarrassed, you know, we move all that out. You know, we, we, we clear that deck completely. I make a lot of mistakes. I tell everybody all the mistakes I make. I'm not embarrassed to share the mistakes that I make with everybody. And I want them to share with the rest of the organization as well. Um, and, you know, hopes that they could fix it, we could fix it together and other departments can avoid it. But you can't have that level of excellence and quality and service without good people, well-trained, well-equipment. It's impossible. So we really go out there to do, uh, to give everybody all the opportunities to succeed, you know. Well, this is an excellent segue into another critical success factor of organizations. And that is, you, you, the first thing you mentioned was people, the people factor. And how important is the company culture? Well, firstly, to you, and what are some of the measures you have in place to maintain the desired culture of excellence and that constant gap analysis and closing those gaps that you've, you speak about at Blue Waters? That, that could be a book. You know, that part, forget, the, forget the, the journey and the story, but that part could be a book. That's a part people, you know, beg, beg me to document what they call the Blue Waters Wave. Um, that part could be a book. It's a lot. I mean, from, you know, I get, first of all, it's all about the people because you can take all the money in the world. And I think, you know, our governments have shown you can buy the best and brightest buildings and best, you know, hospital equipment, everything. But if you don't have the right people trained the right way who want to work in those things, they still don't function. So it starts and ends with people. You don't have good people, you don't have a good business, period. You can have everything else, all the money in the world. No good people, no good business. So it starts with that. And what you gotta do is, I know it myself, you have to love what you do. So we start even with psychometrics. When we're hiring people, we, we wanna know what's in your head. Um, we're not more inclined about what your skills are. You know, we're looking for attitude. You know, we wanna hire attitude and teach skills. You know, and, and, and different people love different types of jobs. Some people love accounting, some people love sales, some people love marketing. We just need to make sure we get the right people in the right jobs. So we start with that. We want people to love the jobs that they, they do. They must enjoy, it mustn't feel like work. If it feels like work, then something is wrong. You gotta love it. Because you're gonna go, you have to put in crazy hours here sometimes. Uh, things go wrong in manufacturing. If you make a commitment, you have to work overtime. You have to make uh, special deliveries, it happens. Uh, but if people don't enjoy uh, what they're doing, then it's impossible for them to, to do it. And so we, we start with good people, give them the right training, and, you know, we, 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 we treat them like owners. So we have this, you know, customer-supplier relationship, you know, internally. And I kind of picked this up from being in retail in your years, you know. Who is your customer and what do your customer expect out of you? So everybody inside of Blue Waters knows who is their customer, whether it's internal or external, and what that customer expects of them. I mean, even the guys in the warehouse, you know, if you ask them who, who is their customer, they will tell you it's the 80 trucks that they load every day. They know who their customers are, and they know what their customers expect out of them. The, the customers expect the trucks to be loaded on time, accurately, without damage. They would have done a good job. They would have met their customers' expectations if they loaded the trucks on time, accurately, without damage every day. And as an organization, we need to make sure that they have the right tools, the forklifts, the training, uh, the compensation, the time off when it's when they're tired, to be able to do that regularly. You know, so every part of the organization is broken down to who's the customer or what the customer expects out of you. 
And I always say, if you meet and exceed your customer expectation, how could you go wrong? Whether you're in any business, you know, if I booked a, a, a flight on Caribbean Airlines and you promised to take me where I'm going at a certain time on a certain day, and I reach there and it's pleasant, everybody's smiling, the plane is great, I get where I'm going. You know, why would I not want to fly you again? You know, if I went to your restaurant and, you know, in my mind, I promised you see this lovely picture of the food and the price and, and you tell me, you know, I have a, a, a reservation for eight o'clock and if I come there and it, everything is as I expected, why would I not come back? You know, you know, it's, 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 so if you, if I run a restaurant, I would say, okay, what would be all the things that would stop me from giving Dion what she expects? She made a reservation at eight o'clock. Uh, maybe she told me that I have these things on the menu items. And if I have what she expects and I, the waiter smiles and the food was great and the service was quick uh, or what have you, and the place was clean and the bathroom smelled nice. Why would she not come back? Why would she not tell a friend? Why would she not bring an another friend again? So, you know, to me, in, when you lose a customer, you lose a customer because you broke a promise to them. You did not meet their expectations, you know? So in any business, and that's, that's as simple as that. So throughout the organization, we know who are, who are our customers and what they expect out of us, both internal and external. Because you're speaking there to the seamlessness of the culture where everyone is basically singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. They're operating on particular premises and those premises are feeding into their objectives and feeding into what they deliver and have consistently delivered over time. And, and, and it's not, you know, we, it's, it's inclusive. I always tell myself, I don't have a monopoly on great ideas. Okay, I don't. You know, we don't have a policy handbook. We call it best practices. It's not the Bible, the Quran, the Ten Commandments, it's not that. It's not, you know, people put these things down and they're fixed. It's not that. You know, we, what we have is the best practice and that's just the best way we happen to know at this time to do things well. And, you know, like last year we had a stupid rules competition and it was like, you know, we had throughout the whole organization, tell us all these stupid rules that we have, tell us why they're stupid, give us ideas to, to, um, to improve on them. And, and if we adopted the idea, we'll pay you for it. So, I mean, so there's nobody inside our organization. If you're, you know, a lot of people will be employees in organizations and they have crappy rules, crappy policies. The customers don't like it. They know it doesn't make sense either, but they can't do anything about it. I hate stupid rules. Everybody by us hate that. So if we know we want to serve the customer and we know we found a better way to do it, explain it, prove it, we'll change it. You know, so, so, so that's one of the things inside of here. So that even makes the work enjoyable for people is that you can change the stuff that, that, that is required to help you do your job better you know, or do your job more consistently. That's, that's anybody could do that in Celebrity Waters. And, and that's excellent because you make persons feel as though they are stakeholders, that they are part of the process and you achieve greater buy-in that way because when human beings are and feel appreciated, you get a different kind of response from them. At least that has been my observation and experience. You speaking to best practices, and we know that globally there's a focus on environmental best practice. And in what ways is Blue Water seeking to reduce your carbon footprint as a company? So, so there are several ways. So what we've been doing over the years, uh, people may or may not know, but we actually have an agriculture division. So I mean, you, you could practice first, you know, what they call carbon offsets. So you know, they know you know you're polluting uh, in one area, but you're going to do something that will offset some of that, so you can be carbon neutral. So you know, on our farm, we planted over twenty thousand coconut trees. So you know, so we're into agriculture as well. So that's one of the things that we've done to offset. Uh, we, you know, all of our pallets, we actually recycle them. We make mulch uh, uh, for the garden, which that, you know, in the rainy season helps uh, keep the weeds down so you don't have to spray uh, pesticides on it. In the dry season, helps retain water so you don't have to waste water when it's, you can't get any dry season. So we do some of that. We've always been lightweight and, uh, you know, take as much plastic as we could out of the bottle within reason. We don't want it to get to the point where the bottles feel like a penny cool. Uh, we have some competitors whose bottles feel like that. I don't think ours has gotten there yet. We hope not to have to get there. Um, and then also when you when you upgrade equipment, you know, you get equipment that uses less electricity, less plastic, less waste. You know, we do those things. And then now we're actually uh, doing a pilot project with one of our competitors 
to uh, bring back these plastic bottles. And eventually, when Trinidad passes, hopefully they'll pass an intelligent beverage bill, similar to what Barbados has, we would be able to uh, collect enough material to actually put a recycling plant. And that's, so that's on our agenda to make bottles be very similar to, to carry glass, where you can go bottle to bottle. So we want to hopefully, in three, four years, have that kind of a system where our plastic bottles can be returned and reused and made back into bottles again. So we have a closed loop system. So that's something that we're working on and we hope, you know, maybe shortest time, three years, longest time, five years, we'll actually get it done. So that's high on our agenda. Oh, that's excellent because, uh, you know, as, a, as an island state, a small island state, and we're a region that is vulnerable to the impact of climate change, and it is noteworthy that our businesses are actively pursuing best practices to offset the carbon footprint. And your mulch is great. I'm an avid gardener myself, and it is a staple in terms of what I use. It's, it's, it's good mulch, and it does exactly what you have highlighted. So that is excellent. At the risk of stating the obvious or, you know, not uh, honing the obvious, what motivates Dominic Hadid? You know, I, I guess it's still, um, part of it is, you know, I believe we're all put on this good for a reason. And I kind of believe, I want, I want to leave my fingerprints behind. I don't think I'm that great that they're going to write books about me or anything like that per se. But, you know, I like, uh, I like the fact to say, you know, we started Blue Waters and, you know, we created five, 600 jobs. You know, none of our competitors in the soft drink business went out of business because of us. Uh, so I like the fact these are new jobs. I like the fact that we can make, hopefully help people be more healthy in what they do, um, extend their lives. Um, but, but the truth is that it was, I touched on it earlier, you know, where people always say in the Caribbean, we can't do that. That doesn't work here. So what really motivates me, anything that we do, is I like to prove that wrong. You know, I think in the Caribbean, we could do things as good as, and in many cases, better than uh, what could be done elsewhere. Our only issue really is scale. You know, we're, we're not as big as them, so you don't really see it that much. Or two, we just believe that we can't. You know, for whatever reason, people told you can't do that. Well, you know, in school, I was the most naughty child. That everything, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm like, why you can't? Just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean it can't be done. And again, if you, you, you touch on how much, you know, nobody's going to buy mulch and turn that. Well, guess what? They do. Oh, uh, we do. We and do. if you do it well, they do it, you know. And all of this stuff, that we, you know, we also have honey on the farm um, as well, you know, the, under the Wit Love brand, that's that's also from our farm. We do that well also. We don't have enough of it, but that does well. And in any of the businesses we do, it's like, again, it's just showing that you could, you can take this philosophy to say, okay, well, he was a fluke. It worked in Blue Waters. doesn't work anywhere else. But, but guess what? It's working in other things as well. And I'm hoping that more people would be able to realize that and, 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 and pursue it. You know, we don't have, you know, the companies that fail or don't scale in, in the Caribbean, again, the ones that cut corners. I don't want to say anything, but they cut corners. You know, you, you don't go to a cocktail party and you hear, you know, Blue Waters went out of business. You know, Dominic was a great guy. His staff was well trained. His product was excellent. His quality was consistent. His service was amazing. You don't hear that. You know, you hear so and so went out of business. Well, he lied. He cheated. He steal. His product was this. His staff was that. It, that's what happens. You know, and um, it, it, anything you do. I mean, if, if I was a plumber, I'd be the best plumber. If I was a carpenter, I'd be the best carpenter. You know, if I was the guy selling doubles in the road, I'm going to try my best to have the best doubles best taste, the best service, best, and, and anybody can do that. You know, I just don't know why we don't. And, and it's not that much harder to do it well than just doing it. And I, I think a lot of people do it well sometimes, you know, but I, I think what they lack is the consistency, um, you know? So that's what drives me. And I would love to have more people prove me right on that, you know? Uh, Cause again, I wasn't that exceptional school. I was like a, B student, you know, like one, one, five, twos and a C. You know, the one was principal of business, the C was economics. So if it gets too fancy, you're gonna lose me. But but I simply understand that if you go into a business or if you promise somebody that you're gonna do something and you do it, how do you go wrong? How would they bad talk you, as we say in the Caribbean, if you did exactly what they expected of you? 
You know, it, they only bad talk you when you do what you wasn't supposed to do, or you or you did something you didn't tell them you're going to do, or you let them down. So anybody, you know, just going out there and saying I am going to be the best of whatever I am at the moment, how could they fail? You know, even if a company is downsizing, they're not going to cut their best people first. They cut the slackers first. And even if they have a first in, first out, and they cut you, and you are good, and you happen to be the first cut, somebody else is going to take you. <laughs> you understand? It, it, there's always a shortage of good people. There's never a shortage of need for good people in the Caribbean. Anyway, 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 anyway. And we also have a factory in St. Lucia as well. And it's the same thing. You know, you, you, great people always have jobs. You, you know, even if we have less business, I would rather cut something else before I cut the good people because you can't get enough good people. It's just, you know, it's just, I don't know why most people don't understand that, you know? Mr. Hadid, this has been nothing short of awe-inspiring. This, uh, your focus, your commitment, and your drive is certainly one of those uh, motivating factors, and it has been a pleasure. We will certainly... Uh, I'm sure anyone looking at this, this conversation will take away so many golden moments from it that they will come away richer for it. Thank you so much for guesting with us today and for sharing these tremendous insights, not just into Blue Waters, the business, but into you, the human being that runs this business and the many factors that influence your success. Thank you, Dion. Just a couple of things. One, my marketing people will probably be upset because I didn't speak enough about Blue Waters, but it was really more about motivating other people. I don't run Blue Waters anymore. I'm not the CEO. I have a great team of people uh, that are there. I'm, the official title is executive chairman, but they, I actually call myself the head coach, but they the place runs now, the, the system works, and great people like to work with other great people and great people attract great people. Um, you know, so it's definitely not a one-man show. It never was, um, you know, so uh, kudos to my team and, and everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being here with me. We never got a sense that it was an individual effort. You were always out front indicating good people, good people, good people. And that's where we'll end it today. Thank you again, Mr. Hadid, and continue to do what you do and what you do so very well. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our viewing audience. We'd love to get your feedback, so please send it to corpcom at caribbean-airlines.com. That email address, corpcom at caribbean-airlines.com. You may follow our social media channels, LinkedIn, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at iFlyCaribbean. I am Dion Ligo, and this has been Caribbean Connections.